Welcome everyone to the Evangelical Environmental Network Summer of Action. We're so excited that you're joining us here live or watching the recording later. My name is Marcus Cole and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Church Engagement and Outreach here at EEN. And I'm very excited that we are here together today for the Summer of Action. We're gonna get started shortly, but just wanted to leave a couple of quick uh, housekeeping matters. We are recording this today. We're gonna get a chance to hear from some folks that are doing advocacy and taking action already. We're gonna get an opportunity to participate together in some of that. And then our very own Dr. Jessica Mormon is gonna share some about some key opportunities this summer that we're gonna tackle. So it's important that you be engaged today. You can engage in the chat. We have folks monitoring the chat. And then uh, we do ask that you stay on mute because this is being recorded. Um, with that, I'm going to pray and then we're going to get right in. Uh, so yeah, let's turn our attention to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this season. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for how you reveal yourself in creation, whether that's in sunshine or flowers, Lord. You have ordered all of these things. And the pinnacle, the ultimate revelation of yourself in the form of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. When you tabernacled here, Emmanuel, God with us, Lord. And so we just thank you for the sending of your Holy Spirit that is with us, Lord. And we just ask at this time, glorify your son and that we simply hear your will and do your will here on earth as it is in heaven. We do all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's get started with our summer of action. Uh, we wanted to share first a welcome and a little bit of our vision. So we're going to go to that next slide and just share why do a summer of action? Why do this kickoff that leads into this entire summer? And it really is about taking action to defend God's creation. Now, some of you know this already throughout the year, many of you are already regularly taking immediate individual action that's meaningful. And we love that and we value that. And some of those folks are here today to share some of that action they've taken already. Uh, but this summer of action is really an opportunity for us to collectively share our message and our values while inviting new folks in our communities and our congregations to come alongside and take some of those first steps towards direct action. And we have an activity today to do that very thing. And so this action just isn't any type of action. It is guided by a few principles that we want to share with you. And we have that both uh, in the form coming out of scripture and this visual that I love. But really, the guiding principles are coming out of Matthew 22 and 25. The idea of loving our neighbor and the least of these by ensuring a healthy environment where all can have the abundant life that Jesus came to give. And, and we see that coming out in these principles of fairness, uh, uh, of doing things that are just, and avoiding danger and hazards. And, and that comes out from these principles and overflows into some, some policy uh, pillars that we look at here at EEN and we invite you into this summer. Specifically, uh, that's defending life. It really is the core and center of what we do here at EEN and what we're inviting you into here at EEN as we reclaim and rediscover the biblical mandate to care for creation. And that defending life leads into protecting God's creation. And we believe that as we're protecting God's creation and defending life, it really is a great opportunity to create and sustain family sustaining clean jobs. And so the policies that we're, we're inviting you into and in sharing and advocating for and taking action this summer flow from some of those principles. And with that, what I want to do is give you a real life example of how that looks in community. And we're going to share a quick story from Reverend Dean Van Farrow, who's a pastor out of Calvary Reformed Church in Cleveland, Ohio, and how his church is using those principles and taking on some of those policy uh, pillars to take action right now. My name is Dean Van Faro, and I've been a pastor here at Calvary Reformed Church in Cleveland, on Cleveland's west side, for about 22 years. So there is a retirement village that is about three or four miles from our church building called the Franciscan Village. And for years, uh, seniors who live there were experiencing fumes and smells when they went outside into the atrium outside of their building. 
They didn't know that this was coming from a natural gas well. Cool idea of, of oh, what, yeah, yeah. what it used to be and envision this being all open space back at the time. That is where the well actually was. Um, and the statue of St. Francis was right there. And so when the Franciscan village decided to build a new unit, they ran into this well. It began to become a real safety issue. As we were digging for footers and foundations, they struck the head of a, an abandoned orphan well. We kind of quickly realized it was still pretty active. You could hear it, you could feel it, uh, it was still kind of rushing out. And they began to realize, like, wow, this is going to be something that could affect our neighbors, the school next to them, the church next to them, etc. It became very real to us that this was a public health issue for many different people in that corridor. This is one of thousands, tens of thousands that dot this country. There's so much to be done, like where do you start? Air pollution is very real to us. When the methane gets released from you know, natural gas wells, it comes along with benzene comes along with formaldehyde, it comes along with other chemicals that are really dangerous. Currently, Cleveland is the number two asthma capital in the entire country. You know, I have nine children, two of them, and one in particular has respiratory issues. So it is a little alarming when you realize that some of these things, while expensive and are time consuming, are like right in your backyard and kind of almost easy to remedy if you just try. Mm -hmm. Methane is the major greenhouse gas. When it is emitted, it is helping to keep that heat trapped here down at this level. The high number of high heat index days that Ohio is experiencing, that's a natural disaster. The scriptures make it clear that the very first command is to care for creation. I want my church to understand that this is an epic gospel that we have. God's renewing the entire thing. And that includes creation, big time. And when you talk about things that people love, whether it's their dog, whether it's their garden, whether it's the, you know, the sunset over Lake Erie, they get it. Okay, this is valuable too. God made this. Our first goal with, with creation care and with climate change is to get people back to the joy of creation. Then as we introduce the bigger issues like climate change, they realize, okay, this is something that I care about. This is something I need to care about because it's something that I love. We really want to get people out into the environment and experience it. We have to monitor these wells. To me, it needs to be a regulatory issue. We've got to get out there. We've got to look at these wells regularly to make sure that they're not emitting nothing. The older I get, the more I realize how tenuous this planet is. To me, it really comes back to joy. Creation is a joyful thing to experience and to realize that to keep that joy, we have to take care of it. Thanks for that, Pastor Dean. And as we get ready to transition to our next section with the round table, I just want to note a couple things you heard there in that story. Uh, you heard Pastor Dean center the gospel, right? That it, it really is, he wants to bring his church, as he said, back to the gospel. But what led them into that, as I heard him talk about it, is defending life there. These seniors that are in this place, uh, the air quality, what's going on. You heard him talk about joy. You heard him talk about the effects on the environment. And what didn't get said out loud, but what I love in the visuals are those folks working in the background, right? They have those hard hats on. And so capping those wells provides an opportunity uh, to, for, for some of those jobs. But what I want you to see is that Pastor Dean uh, is doing that on the ground. And there are lots of folks all over the country doing that on the ground. So I'm going to invite some folks to come off of mute. And I think we have a slide here with some of their names and locations so you can see exactly where they're coming from. But uh, I want to invite Jasmine Sosa off of mute, uh, Tim Olson, and Jack Joseph off of mute to share with you all today. Uh, and I'm very excited about this advocacy roundtable because these are some of the next generation of leaders that we have already taking action in our EEM community. And so with that, 
Uh, maybe what I'll do is start by just uh, allowing them to introduce themselves. And we'll start with Jasmine, uh, if we want to go to that next slide. Jasmine, can you tell us where you're checking in from and a little bit about your congregation in your role there and what you do? Yeah, so I am from Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I actually work for Grace Midtown Church, which is the Atlanta <laughs> campus for um, where Marcus attends, and I am the community engagement director, so that is anything related to local outreach as well as global nonprofit initiatives, um, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Jasmine. Tim, can you check in a little? Where are you checking in from, and, and where, what? tell us a little bit about your congregation. Well, I am checking in from Laverne, Minnesota. Um, I, my congregation has changed a bit since I have left the pastorate about 15 years ago, ran a nonprofit, and now have kind of retired from that and have this wonderful privilege to work with EEN as the upper Midwest coordinator, particularly looking at the federal farm bill and the conservation mm -hmm. section. So my congregation, to, or my parish really, are folks, the good people that live in Minnesota and Iowa and the Dakotas. And so uh, we've uh, remarkable stories out there that I can't wait to share with people. Yeah, that's going to be, I can't wait for them to hear it. And then Jack, if you can fill us out, uh, where are you checking in from and tell us a little bit about your congregation. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Jack Joseph. I actually live in Westerville, Ohio, which is a suburb uh, just north of Columbus, Ohio. And I'm a uh, participating member of uh, Vineyard Columbus, which is a very large um, uh, consortium of churches. We actually have uh, five campuses, uh, very multi-ethnic. Um, so I have no official role in the church, but I have been participating with the Creation Care Team, uh, which is a fairly new ministry started about uh, a little over a year ago. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jack. And I, I love that this panel here, we have geographic diversity, we have different levels of working within and outside of the church. We got rural, urban, suburban, I love all that. And then maybe what I'll do is, Jasmine, I'll turn to you again with maybe this question of why care for creation at all? And then what that care leads you to do? What does advocacy look like for you uh, working with the EEN? Yeah, and I realized I skipped right over your question. Our demographic is predominantly young families and college students. However, um, we're part a part of a family of churches um, that span several different demographics all around the East Coast. Um, so sorry for skipping that, but yeah, why care for creation? Um, I was introduced to this idea of creation care by someone who had mentored me really, really early on. Um, I want to say I was 14 or 15, um, and I'd never seen scripture paired so beautifully. And, and it was the literal translation of how I was reading this call to care for creation, but I wasn't really seeing that um, communicated from the pulpit. Um, I didn't really have that many leaders, at least in the South, talking about it, but I was aware of jokes that people would make like, oh, I'd love for my kids to have Florida one day. Um, you know, <laughs> So I think there was the levity of the space or the care for it, but there wasn't actually the care in tying in scripture. Um, and so since then, having lived in downtown Atlanta um, and working with young families that all care about this and this matters to them. Um, it does feel kind of unique to be in the city of Atlanta versus like the remainder of the state. Um, so I do feel like I get a little bit of, of a gift to be in the space where people do care about um, the next generation having access to clean air, clean water, things like that. Um, and I, I think to some extent, why care for creation? There's a biblical mandate for it for me, <laughs> as well as um, I just enjoy being outside and I don't quite see it being super equitable. I'm Hispanic. Um, I didn't grow up uh, learning to appreciate nature. Um, it was very much this mentality of my parents used to say when I would ask them to go camping, um, I'm paying a lot of money in rent and in mortgage. <laughs> so there wasn't quite the understanding of why creation mattered or why we should spend time outside and being outside is so healing. Um, and so there's even a personal goal and mission I have to get more women outside and to get more women of color outside as well. And just even talking about all the ways in which it benefits your mental health, your spiritual health and things like that. So long winded. Yeah, oh, we, no, we can hear the passion and so much of that starting with scripture and then tying in some of your personal story and experiences and the values of your congregation. Tim, tell us a little bit, uh, why care for creation? What's going on in the, up in the upper Midwest you're talking about? 
Well, as, as a Minnesota farm boy, I was surrounded by creation in all sorts of ways, whether it's on the farm with livestock and crops, seeing death and growth and, and, and birth. Um, the days I spent wandering in the grove around our farm, looking at the birds, looking at the plants. It's really a personal ethos with me that grows out of this, if I'm a lover of God, I, I need to love what God loves. And that's creation. In, in the creation story, he said, all is good. And so if it's all good, I have a responsibility to come alongside to be sure that I do my part that keeps it in some way good, sustains goodness that's already there. Um, I, I just think that, you know, I'm at, I'm not the new generation. I think my job is to help prepare the next generation. And I think part of that is to tell the story of what's going on of, of, of people of various generational demographics in my neck of the woods in rural Minnesota and, and Iowa and the Dakotas that truly are driven by faith. I mean, they, are, they have a land legacy. They have a care for the land that starts first with a love of God and a sense of call of stewardship to take care of this precious gift that they've been given. So I can't help but care for God's creation when you're hanging out with creation and God's people who loves creation. Yeah, I love that. As you said, the, the Minnesota farm boy that loves God and loves creation because God calls it good. That's beautiful. Uh, Jack, I'd love for you to kind of round us out before we start talking about actual actions you all are taking. Jack, uh, in Westerville, Ohio, why care for creation? Um, well, I'm, I'm older, uh, so I, I'm 65, I'll admit. Uh, and, you know, I grew up with this whole idea of ecology, which if anyone remembers that word. Um, I also grew up um, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and heard all the horror stories about, you know, it being, you know, so, so dark because of the steel mills, they had to turn on street lights at noon. Um, and, and also my background is I've uh, been primarily a consultant working in government and understood that it's, you know, individuals can certainly have, have impact, but it truly is going to take systematic, governmental, even international efforts to resolve the problems that we have created and it's going to take time. And that's why, you know, as I retired and was looking for what was my next mission, uh, this just fell into place. Yeah, I love that. And we love that we have you in the community uh, with on mission. And so maybe what I'll do, speaking of mission and what action looks like, Tim, I'll turn back to you. You, you talked about some of those exciting stories. Can you share with us just very briefly, what has advocacy looked like for you in the upper uh, Midwest there? You mentioned where you are now. You mentioned Iowa, a couple other places, the Dakotas. What does advocacy look like for farmers out there? I think advocacy looks at, I think part of, part of the dilemma is the lack of appreciation from the general public. Of many of our farmers who are managing multi-million dollar businesses, all of them are, and how they have placed care of the soil, of the water, of the resources they've been gifted with, and they're, and they're doing it actually risking financially sometimes. Um, we have a, I have a neighbor uh, who's a far, young farmer family. They, they farm 7,000 acres and they, everything is under use of cover crops and following regenerative agriculture principles. And these are people of great deep faith, driven by that faith. And they talk about when they started this journey seven years ago, their neighbors said they were crazy. Why are you doing this? Now, those same neighbors are coming to them and saying, can you help me do what you've done? And so I think part of this advocacy is you pray, you study, you pray, you act, you model. And I think that's the story we need to talk about, that there are people already in the field, so to speak, here in rural upper Midwest, they're carrying out that vision and that passion of stewardship and creation care. Yeah, I love that. And I'm gonna to come to you in a second, Jasmine, but I just love that. Uh, Tim, it reminds me of the old churchy word we used to use, witness, right? Like you, your, your prayer and your work is a witness to the goodness of God and that other people are like, what's going on? Why, why is this going well? How can we be a part of that? I, I love yeah, that. Mo modeling is the best way of showing and convincing. There you go. 
That's good. And, and Jasmine, recently you got a chance, I think, to work with EEN and model some of that. So maybe not cover crops, but you, you were doing some advocacy work. Uh, what were you doing and, and what was the issue and, and what did you get a chance to do? Yeah, so I was actually able to, thanks to EEN and some other partner networks, um, head up to DC and do some lobbying. Um, and just to say, hi, we are Southern evangelicals that care about this, specifically caring about clean air um, and clean air regulations and opportunities for the for our students, um, for our children, um, talking through with our personal representatives um, in Atlanta, but we all went to DC to do that. Um, so I'm sure we're all familiar with lobbying at this point, but it was just such a, um, it was such a in, like intentional time of being able to share specifically a little bit about my story my family, my brother, my dad, and I all have asthma. Um, and my dad's Cuban, he's an immigrant, swam for three days to Guantanamo Bay, um, made his way up to Georgia, never had had issues with um, any breathing issues at all in, in his entire life. And then all of a sudden in his mid twenties within a year of living in Atlanta had debilitating asthma. Um, and my brother is a, a student athlete. And so I was able to share a little bit about, especially how for, a sweet little Mexican Cuban boy, <laughs> first generation, how uh, any ideas of college or secondary education, um, any dreams of that, we're going to have to happen through scholarships. And so baseball has been his avenue. He got a full ride to North Georgia um, and is working with an MLB development team. And he was diagnosed with asthma in high school. And so there was a really big fear of, hey, is the air quality going to inhibit my ability to have a future, to have a secondary education? Um, and so I kind of got to speak a little bit into my personal story. So did my coworker. And we talked about why we care about this, um, especially as evangelicals in the South. And so that was what we previously did. We have a lot of fun summer of action things planned. I'm not sure if we'll talk about that later, um, but we've had, we've gotten to inspire our politicians um, through personal stories um, and then also just reframe the narrative for a lot of folks in the South um, about what it is to be an evangelical that cares about the environment in the South. Yeah, I love that, Jasmine. And I'm going to turn to you in a second, Jack, but I heard, Jasmine, you say, uh, I'm a Christian, right? You, you came in and you said, I'm a Christian, but I care. And you talked about some of those values and you shared story and that action taking didn't require you to be a climate scientist. It required <laughs> you to be a daughter and a sister. And, and I love how you shared that story. Uh, Jack, you mentioned that it's uh, Creation Care is a relatively new ministry for you all there at the vineyard at your location. Can you share a little bit about what advocacy has looked like at the start, right? You guys are just starting a little bit. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, actually, I will credit EEN and, uh, you know, the pe people on this call, and I'm not sure Kim Anderson's on, but uh, she's also been very encouraging, um, being fairly close to me. But uh, probably the, the biggest impact has been uh, as a uh, EEN uh, creation care champion, I uh, actually uh, prepared and testified to the uh, two EPA uh, hearings. Uh, the first one uh, was on uh, uh, methane uh, controls and you know uh, what their proposed rules, uh, which then I leveraged into a letter to the editor that somehow got published in our local paper, the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, which I didn't even know about. Some friend of mine from the gym told me, oh, great letter. Uh, so that was good. Uh, um, but also uh, just within the last few weeks, I received a handwritten note and I could tell it was handwritten because it was illegible from my Senator Sherrod Brown uh, who read the letter and complimented me on it. So it doesn't take a, you know, a lot of effort to get um good attention i i love that jack i actually personally didn't even know about the handwritten note that's news to me and that is well i didn't tell anybody yet <laughs> so. well there you go you all are hearing it live if you're live with us today you heard that that a policymaker hand wrote a note back because he was so moved by that testimony and what i heard and i'll end with this last question and then we're going to turn to how everyone on this call and watching the recording can take action but what i heard from you jack was the power of a prophetic voice, right? Whether that was giving testimony at the EPA, turning that into a letter to the editor, 
and a friend that you didn't even approach saw and heard that and said, hey, good, good, good job on that. And then our policymaker saw and heard that prophetic voice and responded. So I love that. And so maybe what I'll do with the last little bit of time we have as a roundtable is, uh, Tim, if you can share with us, what are some next steps? What's happening next in your community? How you all are taking action? <clears throat> I think part of it is is with my work with EEN, there's a new farm uh, farm bill landing page and there's a series of blogs being posted there. So we're trying to again, tell the story what people are doing. Um, I think part of this is also uh, I'm working with a local technical school to to model what I call the healthy garden initiative. Healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy food, healthy people. And how do we begin to use that as a leverage? Uh, we have farms, we also have the local consumer, the local uh, person living at home. How can they be part of this movement that's practical, that they can do? It's not just something big and outside of the realm of their capability, but how do we bring it home? And so those are a couple of things that I'm working on right now. I love that. I love making it uh, hyper-local and hyper-intentional, Tim. That, that's really good. Jasmine, what are some things happening this summer at Grace Midtown, ways that you all are taking action? Yeah, um, so from a practical standpoint, we are hosting a summer of fun um, and having a couple of church-wide activities where we're all just getting outside in God's creation. And one of those things is an event called Pedal to the Park. Um, in Atlanta, we have something called the Beltline, which is a strip that's like a extended sidewalk that circles all around Atlanta. It goes right in front of our church and leads to a local park. Um, we are also in a pretty unique space of Atlanta. We're surrounded by a ton of civil rights history. Um, and so our plan is to you know, pedal to the park from, with our bikes from the church to a nearby park, um, learn a little bit about Atlanta's history along the way, and specifically even just to notice where we are. Um, our neighborhood has experienced a lot of marginalization. In, and in some ways, that's um, environmental spaces, some of that's like equitable. There's, I mean, there's, it, it's all intertwined. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to focus on was specifically what's called a tree equity score. And so talking about some of the tree coverage and um, how tree coverage actually provides some life-saving benefits to communities that often communities of color, low-income marginalized communities don't have access to. And so our church demographic, we've got some pretty um, affluent young families, um, but our church itself is situated in a pretty marginalized community. And so trying to bridge some of the gap of when you know better, you do better. And we're doing this through a fun social hang. Um, and additionally, I think even just introducing EEN through all the different virtual events y'all have has created and sparked a lot of conversations with the young professionals in Atlanta who have said, hey, you know what, I actually I do believe in all these things. This is the first time I've seen the intersectionality of, hey, my faith can actually affirm a lot of these beliefs that in my gut, I knew were right. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea of pedaling to the park and talking and taking an observation, having eyes to see, as Jesus says, what's around you. Jack, what are some next steps there in, in Ohio? What are, what are you all doing? You mentioned our wonderful state uh, organizer down there, Kim. What are you all doing next? So, um, so Kim is, is uh, trying to schedule some uh, meetings with uh, the governor's office and the um, you know, our environmental protection agency, um, which she's asked myself and uh, uh, several other people to participate in, which I'm looking forward to again, having uh, worked in government and I think understanding a little bit about how it works. And um, I think I could be helpful with but also we're um, uh, are working on even as of uh, this week on uh, a community garden that's a, uh, attached to our uh, local food pantry and starting planting and hopefully engaging the local uh, uh, community around there, which is a lower economic, uh, level community, very um, uh, ethnically diverse. So we're hoping to use that to you know, engage people um, and also grow our team. So bringing more people in, uh, members of the church it, to be involved in uh, activities like that. So we've got a multi-pronged approach. 
I love that, Jack. There is the policy work happening at the upper echelons of power in your community. And then there is how do we come alongside and feed our neighbors? Uh, that, that feels very kingdom minded. I love that. And so as, I want to thank and if you all in the chat box will thank Tim and Jack and Jasmine for sharing just a little bit about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And maybe most importantly, why they are doing that for the kingdom of God. I'm gonna invite my, my colleague and my dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Jessica Mormon off of mute, our, our Vice President for Science and Policy. Jessica, I heard live, maybe you knew this already, a handwritten letter from a policymaker. I know you and Kim are gonna be following up on that. So yes, take us away, Jessica. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marcus. And thank you to Jasmine, Tim, Jack for sharing your stories. I am so inspired by that. And again, we heard it first here today, Jack, what a wonderful uh, testimony of advocacy and action um, of uh, uh, an EPA testimony on uh, the where you testified to the EPA on the importance of methane, turning that into a letter to the editor that got your senator's attention. Um, that is just the power of lifting your voice. Um, and that is what we want to inspire and empower and come alongside each and every one of you this summer to do. And I want to share with you today some key opportunities um, that we are tracking here at EEN of ways that you can lift your voice with your your friends and your family, at your church, in your community, and yes, even with your elected officials, um, uh, both at your state houses all the way up to Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, as, as Tim teed up for us, um, one of our, our big focuses this summer and opportunities this summer is with the reauthorization of the Farm Bill. This is something that happens every five years. And this year, um, Ian is coming alongside um, listening to hearing from uh, farmers, ranchers, foresters to hear um, how this, this really uh, consequential policy, how this farm bill um, impacts their uh, uh, ability to be, again, good stewards of God's creation and how that can help them engage more uh, readily and easily in sustainable agriculture practices, natural climate solutions, uh, many of those that that Tim um, uh, lifted up. And, and one thing that I do want to uh, share is that uh, whether you are coming from a rural community, a farming community, or a suburban to an urban community, the Farm Bill impacts all of us, um, and especially um, uh, so many of our members of Congress, this is the first time that they are engaging in the Farm Bill process. And so no matter where you live, uh, this matters to you. And so I wanna take a moment uh, uh, to show a, a quick video. If you're not familiar with the Farm Bill, just a quick primer and video of what it is. What is the Farm Bill? Every five years, Congress drafts and passes a new US Farm Bill. This huge piece of legislation includes hundreds of billions of dollars for everything from crop insurance for farmers to food assistance for hungry families. Additionally, the Farm Bill includes $6 billion in annual funding to improve water and soil health, conserve habitats, and harness the power of God's creation to combat climate warming pollution. The current Farm Bill expires this year, which means Congress is already hard at work crafting the next one. Historically, the Farm Bill has had strong support across the aisle, meaning that this year's reauthorization of the bill is a big opportunity to make bipartisan progress toward defending God's creation and addressing climate change. To learn more about what's included in the Farm Bill and how to show your support, visit creationcare.org slash farm. What is Excellent. And so you've got the link in the chat to go and, and learn more. Um, and read several uh, pieces, some blogs that Tim has uh, created for us, um, lifting up farmer stories um, of how the farm bill as well, it has impacted their operations as well as uh, how they're engaging in uh, protecting God's creation and keeping it good for the next generation through sustainable agricultural practices. Now, one thing that Ian had been, has been doing over the last year is getting uh, amongst farming communities and our uh, farmers of faith 
across the country to hear from them. What do they need uh, uh, in this year's Farm Bill to help them be those good stewards of God's creation? And we've come up after listening to uh, our farmers uh, several recommendations. And these are some of our key asks this summer as we're engaging with um, our elected officials on the farm bill. These are some key asks that um, came out of those listening sessions. First is uh, asking that uh, uh, cuts to uh, uh, conservation programs and other incentives for farmers to engage in sustainable agricultural practices, that that not be cut, that those resources, those programs, those funds not be cut. Um, because right now there is, it is in danger of uh, uh, some big wins uh, in funding for these programs are in danger of being cut. Um, we need to let our elected officials know that um, all of those resources are much needed uh, by our farmers. Second, advancing on-farm data collection and monitoring of the soil and water health on the land. And uh, for many of you seeing, just like for many of us, uh, often seeing is believing. So being able to see and monitor and quantify those incredible benefits for soil health, for water quality, and carbon sequestration, sequestering, locking in um, uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere back in our soils to enrich it is also an incredible natural climate solution. Uh, farmers ability to uh, actually quantify that is really, really important for uh, 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 not only understanding the scope of the problem as well as the scope of the opportunity, but also to make sure those incredible sustainable agricultural practices that have so many benefits that they can point to share that information with their neighbors and say, wow, look at the real life benefits that I'm experiencing by engaging in these practices. Let me help you do this too. Third is to invest in technical assistance, staffing, partnerships, and especially peer-to-peer -peer information exchanges on what, what these practices are and what are the programs and incentives available. Um, one of the big problems that we heard uh, uh, from farmers was uh, simply not knowing where to go to for information and also that their neighbors were uh, some of those most trusted sources of information about engaging in new innovative practices in sustainable agriculture. How can we, uh, there's much need to uh, continue to resource that area. Um, reducing barriers for uh, conservation uh, for renters was really important, as well as new investments in transformational, resilient agricultural research to stay on the cutting edge. Um, and so these are some of the things that we're advocating for. And um, uh, we do have a, a, a link in the chat. Um, if you would like to uh, send a letter to your uh, senators and representatives now, um, we have an action alert that is live um, to send them a note saying that you want to see uh, strong action on a conservation forward farm bill this year. Um, and we'll make sure that you get that information if you want to engage in that way. So we're working on the farm bill. What else? What other opportunities do we have for you this summer? Um, and if we click over to the next slide, um, we also have opportunities of lifting up and sharing uh, new climate and clean energy benefits for your hometown. So if you've been journeying with us um, at EEN, uh, you may be familiar with some incredible transformational uh, pieces of legislation, some policies that you helped us get across the finish line um, called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. And within uh, these bills are incredible benefits for uh, electrifying your home, electrifying your church, um, access to solar, um, uh, EV charging, um, clean school buses, and other benefits um, that are now available through uh, uh, tax credits, new rebates um, to really engage in climate action and clean energy within your own community, your own church, and your own hometown. And so this is a great opportunity this summer. Um, we want to come alongside you to discover what are the benefits for your community and what are some ways that we can come alongside you to help lift those stories up in your, uh, in your community. And then finally, um, 
advocating for strong pollution safeguards for better health and a safe climate. And so uh, just last week, the EPA released a new bold and ambitious um, safeguard and rule on the amount of carbon emissions and carbon pollution that is allowed to be admitted for power plants of really looking to clean up our power sector, which is one of the uh, uh, greatest opportunities we have to quickly clean our air. And one thing that I love is we are focusing on cleaning up carbon pollution, which contributes to climate change. At the same time, that's also those same controlled technologies are uh, uh, cleaning up our air as well, addressing um, deadly pollutants, um, especially soot, particulate matter that causes uh, and triggers uh, harmful respiratory illnesses. We heard from Jasmine about the impact of asthma on her life, her father, her brother. Um, this rule um, will help make our air cleaner and safer to breathe, all while also addressing uh, uh, and averting dangerous climate change. And so again, at EEN, we're always looking for those win-win-wins. And um, this new, uh, having strong safeguards against carbon pollution from our power plants is a key win-win that we're pursuing uh, this, uh, this summer and want to invite you into with us. And so with that, as we've talked about this, we'd love to put this into action and invite you to uh, put it into practice. And we are going to do a phone banking exercise um, where uh, we've got a script for you and uh, something as simple as uh, grabbing your phone. And so I'll give you guys a moment. If you have your phone handy, um, would love to invite you to pull that out. And if you don't, quickly go grab it um, because we are going to engage in a, a practice of phone banking together to ask our senators to uh, uh, support strong pollution safeguards. So we'll give everyone just a moment to grab your phones um, and uh, we'll uh, put up the script for you here in just a second. Great, I see that Fawn is ready to phone bank. That's fantastic. Um, we'll see in the chat some uh, uh, instructions from Marcus um, to get your phone handy and um, uh, feel free to come uh, on video so that we can all see each other calling uh, together. And so what you'll see, um, this 202 number will connect you to uh, the, um, the switchboard at uh, Capitol Hill in Congress. And uh, a representative will ask you um, who your Senator is. And so pick one of your two senators and we have a message here uh, that you can read and share with uh, your Senator's office. Very often, this will go straight to voicemail. So if you're feeling a little nervous, no worries, um, we've got, everything in hand for you. Often it'll go to a message. If you do get a live person, don't worry about that either. They are so polite and will take your message. And um, it's really, really easy. And so now with that, hopefully everyone's got their phones. And let's uh, dial this number together and share this message of advocacy and action for clean air uh, and a healthy environment. Yeah, uh, Jasmine in the chat says, feeling grateful to have a voice. I agree, my friend. Uh, Kathy says, first phone message, done. Yeah, I could do that again. Oh, oh, we have plenty of opportunity for you to do that all summer long. And I know that Jessica uh, will be very excited to hear that. We're gonna give you an opportunity to sign up to do more of that. A few more, we're gonna let those populate in the chat for those that are live. For those of you that are watching the recording later, feel free to email us or put in the comments below the video, what was it like if this was your first time or if it was your 50th time, what was it like doing it? Uh, Kyle says, my Senator changed his voicemail. Uh, there we go, oh, there's so many coming in, I can't even read them. Uh, and I think it's glitchy, so I couldn't get through, but I will later, there we go. I like that determination to keep trying. Jerry says, first time, call Ted Cruz, got a recording, uh, love that and was unable to leave a message. We'll try again. There you go. That's the energy we need there. Rob says, thank you. I just used the action alert to email about the farm bill. I will call later about the EPA. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead one more slide because Jessica gave us a lot of wonderful information and a lot of opportunities 
to get involved. And so we want to just walk you through really quickly uh, the summer ahead and how you would like to use your voice. And so there are a lot of different ways and the chat box is lighting up for those that aren't here live with us. Oh, I pray, I wish you were, uh, because you, you would see how much advocacy is already happening, how much action is being taken. Um, but right now, the summer ahead for those with us live and those that want to do this later, how can you use your voice? Uh, we actually heard from Jack that he got a chance to use his voice in just this way, writing to your newspaper. Uh, LTE, which means letter to the editor and op-eds, uh, those are wonderful opportunities to get your voice out there so that your neighbors and policymakers can hear. And importantly, you don't have to do this alone. Uh, staff members from EEN are willing to help you with office hours for writing. They're willing to help you pitch and place those op-eds. And I know, what does that mean, pitch and place? That just means we have some resources, know some local newspapers, maybe in your community, maybe some national ones, maybe some online that would be willing to hear from Christians about this. And we wanna help you get your message out and your voice out. Um, and then promote those published pieces on our social media. Uh, for some of you, and we heard already about this, meeting with your elected officials, whether those are local or federal. We heard Jasmine talk about that, right? Uh, going to talk to her policymakers. And what did she do? She shared her story, she shared her value. So we will help you schedule those policymaker meetings. We will help prep you for those policymaker meetings. And if you're comfortable with it, uh, we would love to join you with those policymaker meetings. Uh, this third one, love this one. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, advocating for pollution safeguards, providing written testimony to the EPA for rulemaking, uh, receive a testimony writing toolkit, will help you write those testimonies. And there may even be an opportunity for you to share live. Uh, that's a great opportunity. And for some of you, your comfort level, or you might be really, really good at this already, social media. Uh, we'll put together, we will help you put together a EEN toolkit to amplify action alerts and op-eds. So those action alerts that we're already doing, sounds like someone in the chat box just did an action alert. We wanna help amplify that you just did that. Uh, and also following, sharing, retweeting what EEN is doing and sharing, and then sharing your story with your network. I, I love the story that uh, Jasmine told about both her brother and her father, right? So sharing that story in a meaningful way online and then this community coming around and saying, hey, here's a sister in Christ that's sharing this story. And I think it's a story my people need to hear, right? That's how we can use social media in a positive way when uh, so much of social media can be negative and doom scrolling. Let's be people of hope there. And so how do we do this? I think there's one more slide and a link. So if you want to pull out that phone that's still standing, sitting beside you, you can simply pull up the camera and use this QR code. That is one way. I also know my friends will be putting in the chat a link there that you can click through. And here's what we'd like you to do right now. Yes, right now. Sign up to let us know what it is that God is calling you to do, what you're interested in. Um, what we'll do afterwards, it'll take you to a form. We'll sort everyone out. And then there will be one of us, myself or one of my colleagues at EEN, that will be following up in the next couple of days and saying, hey, we heard you wanna take action this summer. We'd love to help. And we will reach out to do that. And so you can do that in QR code. You can do that through the link in the chat. If there are other people that you think might want to do something like this, um, let them know about it. Send them the recording, send them the emails, and we want to get them involved as well. You'll get a copy of this recording next week or a link to the recording next week as well as all of this wonderful information and uh, a helpful way back to us through links so we'll send that out in email so please don't feel pressure to get all this down right now we just want you to pull out your phone or click on that link have it open in your computer and let us know and so with that uh, i see a, we have a couple more minutes here um, i want to thank you i'm going to pray us out here at, at the end but I do want us to end and just see scripture. We've been talking about our faith values. We've been talking about the gospel, but there, there we, we talked about Matthew 22 and 25, but really Jesus kind of leaves us at the end of the gospel of Mark with this idea of going into all the world and proclaiming the gospel. That is the good news to the whole of creation. Really, that's what we're doing, right? That's that great commandment and that great commission, kind of how those play together, loving the Lord our God, loving our neighbor, 
and then going and being a witness and making disciples. And so with that, I'm going to close us in prayer, uh, invite you to pray, and then release you out into creation to be those witnesses. Father God, uh, we just thank you for the larger story that you reveal in scripture of how you are reconciling and restoring all things back to you through your son, Jesus the Christ. Lord, even today, as we heard a story and saw a video of Dean and how they're defending the lives of seniors in their community, we heard from Jack, we heard from Jasmine, we heard from Tim in these different areas and these different communities, all though a part of the body of Christ, all doing the work that you put before them to glorify Jesus, to advance the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So as we go into this season, this summer of action, Lord, we acknowledge the work that we have already done that you've invited us into individually, Lord. We acknowledge the corporate work that you're inviting our community into this summer. And we just say yes and amen. Your will done here on earth as it is in heaven. We do all this in the name of your son, Jesus, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your time. Thanks for joining the Summer of Action.